let me welcome you to this lecture we will now begin our discussion on group 14 elements and their chemistry of their compounds and uh, to begin with the uh, there are five elements in uh, the group 14 that is we have carbon then we have the next element is silicon and we have germanium tin and then we have lead now among these tin and lead we consider them to be as uh, metals while carbon is considered to be as a non-metal while silicon and germanium they show properties of both metal and non-metal and they are classified as metalloids that we have already learned now if you look at the electronic configuration of these elements what we will see is that there are four electrons in the valence cell essentially for carbon we can write the configuration to be 2s2 2p2 while for silicon it is 3s2 3p2 and for germanium we have also the uh, there are 10 B electrons are present so we have 3d10 and then 4s2 4p2 for tin also we have 10 D electrons that is 4 D 10, 5 S 2 and 5 P 2 and for tin along with 10 D electrons we also have 14 electrons in the F or particles and the electronic configuration for lead it is 4F 14, 5D 10, 6S2 and 6P2. So that is the electronic configuration of lead and uh, by looking at the electronic configuration itself we may recollect the how the uh, atomic um, how the periodic properties of group 13 uh, elements change as we went down the uh, group the, the how the size of the elements change as well as how the ionization energy change because of d orbital contraction as well as for f orbital contraction or for nitronite contraction so here as well we see that when we go from carbon to silicon there is an increase in the size of the element as well as when we uh, go from silicon to germanium we expect that, that there is going to be substantial increase in the size of the element but uh, what happens is so when we go from carbon to silicon to germanium to tin to lead from carbon to silicon the size of element increases abruptly because of uh, because we add electrons to a new uh, cell but then when we go from silicon to germanium because we add 10 d electrons as well and because of the uh, poor nuclear uh, charge shielding effect of these the electrons the size of atom does not increase uh, in substantially and the size of silicon and germanium are more or less same here and then when we go from germanium to tin once again there is a increase in the size of uh, the atomic size Okay. And then when we go from tin to lead, the increase is again not very uh, substantial because we add 14 F electrons which uh, shield the nuclear charge even more poorly than uh, D as well as S and P uh, orbitals or electrons in D and S and P orbitals. So similarly ionization energy also we expect the ionization energy to decrease as we go down the group but it does not happen. Uh, very regularly as when we go from carbon to silicon there is substantial decrease in the ionization energy but when we move from silicon to germanium the decrease in ionization energy is not very substantial while again when we go from germanium to tin there is a difference in the ionization energy as the ionization energy for tin is going to be uh, lower than the ionization energy of germanium here while we when we go from tin to lead Again, the decrease in the ionization energy is going to be not very substantial 
because of lantern ion contraction. So this is how again the periodic properties change in group 14 elements also and the periodic properties are affected by both T orbital contraction as well as by F orbital contraction. So let us now look at the uh, number of isotopes available for these elements. Now for carbon we know there are three isotopes are available uh, for carbon that is we have 12C, we have 13C and we also have a radioactive isotope uh, that is 14C. All these the three isotopes are naturally occurring isotope of uh, the element carbon while uh, in natural abundance of 12C is around 99% while for 13C is around 1% and the natural abundance of 14C is around 1.2 into 10 to minus 10%. So the natural abundance of 14C is very very small that is the radioactive isotope of carbon. Now uh, this 13C, uh, the isotope 13C is the nuclear spin quantum number. We have learned about uh, different quantum numbers and we have learned about spin quantum number for electrons. Now we also have nuclear spin quantum numbers because the nucleus is also a charged particle. So it may also, you know, it also spins along its axis and there is a, a nuclear spin quantum number associated with it, with, with it. And the nuclear spin quantum number for 13C is, or the isotope hydrogen C is non-zero. That is the I value for this or we, we denote nuclear spin quantum number by the symbol I here is equal to half here. So as we have learned that spin quantum number for electrons is also equal to uh, half or magnetic spin quantum number for electrons is equal to half. So similarly for 13 C the nuclear spin quantum number is equal to half and this particular uh, property of uh, this 13 C element uh, uh, or the nuclear spin quantum number is useful because we can do uh, something known as nuclear magnetic resonance or we can use a, an experimental technique called nuclear magnetic resonance to probe the environment around carbon atoms in different compounds. So this is a very a routinely used experimental technique in chemis chemistry laboratories nowadays and it is extremely helpful and this value and it is possible to do nu a nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy for the ele element carbon because if the nuclear spin quantum number of the isotope 13C is equal to half or but for 12C it is not um, NMR active we say because the nuclear spin quantum number for 12C is equal to zero and this particular isotope is present in extremely small quantity and that is why it is not detectable by NMR but again uh, this particular isotope of carbon is important or is useful in a technique called uh, carbon dating or nuclear carbon dating that we have probably already learned. So carbon uh, dating and in fact uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1960 was awarded for the discovery of uh, this technique called carbon dating which allows us to uh, estimate the age of different I know prehistoric uh, items or prehistoric uh, 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 fossils as well as prehistoric uh, stones. So how do how does one do it is that so the, in the atmosphere the uh, concentration of 14C is always in equilibrium because the 14C that uh, it is radioactive in nature it, it undergoes disintegration by beta emission and the counterpart uh, count per, uh, per minute for this uh, uh, 14C is 15.3 count per uh, minute per gram of uh, 14, uh, 14C. So now, uh, uh, now what we know is that this 14C is undergo disintegration by beta, uh, beta emission but at the same time in the environment 14C gets con continuously also formed uh, naturally and because of this the concentration of 14C is always in equilibrium and the concentration of 14C in our body also 
if we take all the carbon atoms in our body uh, at the moment for any living uh, body, the concentration or the percentage of protein C is going to be equal to 1.2 in caliber minus 10 uh, percent. But the moment the living body uh, dies, it stops uh, in taking of uh, carbons, and because of that, the the the, the percentage of 14C in that particular body is going to decrease uh, slowly and by eventually you know finding out the radioactivity of the particular body uh, uh, we can we can find out the age of the uh, body or and which uh, before how many years that particular body was uh, leaving essentially by counting the or getting the uh, beta count of that particular uh, archaeological uh, body. So this is how carbon dating works and you may have already uh, learned about carbon dating. So this is useful and is possible because of the uh, radioactive nature of 14C. So now again we have uh, three naturally occurring isotope of uh, silicon also that is 28 SI, 29 SI and 30 SI. Among these, this 29 silicon isotope is nuclear active isotope. Again, for this isotope as well, the nuclear spin quantum number is equal to half. Uh, similarly, again for germanium, we have uh, five uh, naturally occurring isotopes are present, while for tin, uh, there are 10 naturally occurring isotopes are present, and among these, the isotope 119 SN is NMR active and is useful again uh, for us to probe the natural or the chemical environment in different tin compounds by using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and for lead again we have four naturally occurring isotopes are available. So um, we have now seen how uh, the electronic configuration of uh, different elements in group 14 uh, changes their or affects their uh, periodic properties as well as we have also looked at different types of isotopes available for carbon and silicon and also at the number of different isotopes available naturally occurring isotopes available for the other elements. So now we will look at the different allotropic forms of the first element carbon and then we will uh, uh, we will discuss about different types of compounds formed by uh, these uh, elements mainly carbon and uh, silicon. So, we will stick to mainly carbon and silicon. Now, when we talk about the chemistry of carbon, we know that it is not possible or it will be foolish to uh, uh, try to cover the entire chemistry of carbon within a, uh, within a uh, few lectures or separate uh, within a just in, a, in one particular course because the chemistry of carbon is very vast, in fact, and that is why we will. Uh, stay away or we will refrain from discussing uh, the compounds or the chemistry that is essentially considered as organic chemistry and we will try to stick to only compounds uh, inorganic species uh, of carbon or inorganic compounds of carbon like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide or carbides and during uh, this particular course. Similarly again for silicon as well extensive organic chemistry is uh, already uh, developed and again here also we will uh, we will not you know uh, we will uh, refrain from uh, the expanding to the scope of our discussion uh, beyond a, a certain point so that you know we can cover uh, the only important uh, topics for this particular course. So let us now begin our discussion on the allotropes of carbon. Now you may have already learned in school that there are three allotropes of carbon. One is carbon or ash, carbon black we may say to me. Then we have graphite and then we have learned there is another allotrope which is called diamond. But this particular uh, information is not correct anymore because there are uh, several other allotropes of uh, carbon are already reported and we will discuss about some of these 
allotropes. In fact, uh, graphite itself uh, exists in two different uh, allotropic, uh, two different uh, forms. One is hexagonal, and the other one is uh, one one we call a hexagonal, and the other one is a rhombohedral, or what we call alpha graphite and a beta graphite. So let us discuss about uh, these allotropic forms. And apart from these three allotropic forms, we have so we have here alpha graphite. Which is hexagonal graphite, we can say, because it crystallizes in a hexagonal space group. And we also have beta graphite, which crystallizes in a rhombohedral space group. Then we have diamond, which again, you know, has two, uh, you know, there are, there are two different phases of diamond are also available one is cubic which is more common form uh, of diamond and then we also have a hexagonal form of uh, diamond which is a very rare form of diamond of course but then apart from these three main types of allotropes there are also other allotropes of carbon have been already imported and one can take say graphite which is uh, uh, hexagonal, you know, we know that, that it has layered structure with hexagonal uh, rings of carbon uh, forming, you know, sheet net like structure. And these net like structures are stacked one over the other. But then what we can do is that we can take uh, one sheet of uh, graphite and then, you know, we can strip it away from the other, uh, other layers or other uh, hexagonal uh, nets of uh, this uh, um, uh, carbon. And then that is how what we can do is that. We can have one sheet of uh, this hexagonal sheet or, or hexagonal net uh, of uh, from graphite, and that we call as a graphene, which is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, you know, material. And it has been, you know, in 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the discovery of graphene, which is nothing but one single uh, hexagonal sheet of uh, uh, graphite and uh, it has like, some very interesting properties that again we will discuss and then we can also take one this uh, sheet of graphene and then roll it into a tube so then we will have uh, something known as carbon nano tubes which is again another allotropic form of uh, carbon and what we can do as well is that we can you know go even down further or we can have further miniaturization of these allotropic forms and we can have only a few atoms of uh, carbon forming you know uh, a, a, a sub nanometer a nanometer size you know particle and we call such uh, particles as carbon dots which is size of such particle is you know uh, below 10 nanometer so we call such particles as carbon dots so these are different uh, uh, allotropic forms and apart from this uh, there is another allotropic form which is very interesting and we call these uh, is, as fullerene or and uh, this is a molecular allotropic form and it is again this is a soluble allotropic form of carbon. This is this is nothing but some discrete molecular allotropic form actually of carbon. Again, we will discuss about fullerenes in more detail and we will see what kind of molecular structures are available for uh, these fullerenes. So let us first uh, begin our discussion on, uh, on graphite. As we have already discussed, that graphite essentially hexagonal rings are present 
and these rings are interconnected hexagonal rings of carbon atoms and these rings essentially form a layered sheet like structure. And this is the reason why graphite because of this layered sheet like structure graphite is used as lubricant because the interaction between these layers are really weak. But then we have as we have said that there are two uh, different types of uh, graphite or different two different phases of graphite alpha graphite. So in case of alpha graphite what happens is that these rings or these carbon atoms on two different sheets on they do not lie exactly on top of each other but alternate the carbon atoms in alternate seats lie on top of each other. So that is, we can draw the structure in this way. So what we have here, three seats we see and among these seats the carbon atoms of this seat lie on top of uh, and I know uh, another sheet which is you know, which is after we which we get only after another that is a inter, in, inter, inter, intermediate sheet is present in between these two sheets and what we see that carbon atoms on these two alternate sheets is essentially lie on top of each other in this way. So we level this particular sheet as A and this particular sheet as B and this particular sheet as A. So, in case of alpha graphite, the sequence of staking of different sheets we can write as AB, AB, this type of staking is present. And the uh, CC bond distance here within the sheet is 1.41 picometer which is typical uh, CC double bond uh, distance and the inter sheet distance that is or inter layer distance that is the distance between uh, two carbons atoms uh, uh, carbon atom in two different uh, sheets is equal to 3. 3.35 Sorry, this is 141 picometer, not 1.41 picometer, 1.41 Armstrong it will be. So it is 335.45 picometer. So the interlayer distance uh, or inter sheet distance between the uh, between two different sheets is equal to 335 picometer, and the CC bond distance within a sheet is equal to 141 picometer. So what we see is that the uh, the the interaction between two carbon atoms in two different sheets is, is essentially very weak because the bond distance between them uh, is pretty high as compared to the CC bond distance for a typical uh, double bonds, and that is why these sheets can slip over uh, each other, and this is the reason why graphite can you know is a lubricant so because the sheets can slip over uh, one, uh, one of one another so there is another form of uh, graphite as we have said that is beta graphite and in this case the carbon atoms of uh, the, 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 the sequence of staking is this type a b c a b c uh, this type of staking is present so uh, every third sheet only the carbon atom uh, lie over each other while you know, uh, because we see the staking uh, sequence is like ABC, ABC. So there are two seats in between. 
uh, for which the carbon atom does not exactly lie on top of each other. So that is why uh, uh, this is a different phase of uh, graphite and in case of alpha graphite we see AB, AB type of sticking while in case of beta graphite we see ABC, ABC type of uh, uh, sticking but the bond distance, CC bond distance, intralayer bond distance as well as the inter uh, uh, this layer and distance is uh, are equal for both alpha graphite and beta graphite. Now what we should uh, learn again is that this alpha graphite is the a thermodynamically most stable allotrope of carbon among the all the other allotropes and what we can do is that we can convert alpha graphite into beta graphite by simple grinding and then what we can do is that we can also convert beta graphite back into alpha graphite by heating at 1040 degree Celsius we can convert beta graphite back into alpha graphite as well and these two you know but this uh, we can one can convert these phases into one another So in case of graphite, we see that the carbon atoms are essentially sp2 hybridized, while uh, there the, the in case of diamond, the carbon atoms are sp3 hybridized and are tetrahedral. Or the geometry around the carbon atoms are tetrahedral. So each of the carbon atoms in graphite are essentially uh, bonded to uh, four nearby carbon atoms and uh, this essentially uh, these tetrahedrons uh, form a cubic unit cell cubic unit cell and this is what we call as diamondoid structure essentially and that is the reason or this diamondoid structure because of the diamondoid structure diamond this allotrope diamond is the hardest uh, material or its hardness is extremely high and it is used in as a cutting tool in for different uh, pre precise machinery or if one wants to make then diamond is used as a cutting tool uh, now in terms of chemical reactivity uh, diamond and graphite as well as in terms of uh, physical properties also we have seen that uh, diamonds and graphite uh, differ because diamond is very hard while uh, graphite is uh, very soft in nature because of the layer structure while because of this Diamondoid structure, tetrahedral carbon atoms in diamond, diamond is extremely hard. Again, in terms of chemical reactivity, also diamond is uh, chemically unreactive in nature, while graphite do undergo uh, several reactions. And it is, uh, um, though it is uh, alpha graphite is thermodynamically the most sta stable form, it is not kinetically inert, but it is kinetically labile. So what we can uh, we can discuss about a couple of reactions of graphite here. So one can take graphite and it will undergo oxidation with concentrated nitric acid and this will essentially produce this is known as meritic acid so similarly graphite also undergoes reaction with elemental fluorine the fluorine is one of the most reactive substance and it reacts with almost anything so it also undergoes reaction with graphite and if the temperature is around uh, 400 to 500 degrees Celsius what we will have is C 
formation of CFX or carbon monofluoride uh, where the X is equal to 0 0.68 to 0 0.99. So this is a, we, we get uh, we get a compound with variable formulation that we term it as carbon monofluoride because the number of fluorine is almost equal to 1 here and because of this reason because graphite reacts with element of fluorine these graphite electrodes undergo corrosion when we do uh, electrolysis of potassium fluoride and HF. When we do undo, undo electrolysis of this to produce F2, because for fluorine is essentially produced by electrolysis of uh, potassium fluoride uh, and uh, in HF medium. So, uh, and uh, this fluorine that is uh, produced electro, uh, ele by electrolysis essentially uh, corrode the graphite electrodes that are used and this reaction is also catalyzed by hydrogen fluoride that is used in the electrolysis process for during the uh, preparation of elemental uh, fluorine. So then again what we can do is that graphite also undergoes reaction which uh, fluorine at temperature above 650 degrees Celsius to produce different compounds like CF4, C2F6 or C5HF12, these sort of compounds or mixture of such compounds are produced when we increase the temperature uh, to, to 650 degrees Celsius here. Now another important type of reactions that graphite undergo because of its layered structure because the graphite have layered structure here and the interlayer distance is pretty high we have seen it is uh, 335 uh, picometer and now other substances or other species can enter this Interlayer, spe uh, interlayer space in graphites and then uh, we will uh, essentially uh, we, this process of you know inserting other chemical species inside the interlayer uh, space of such layered compound we call it as intercalation intercalation and the kind of compound that we will result after intercalation of different chemical species in such layered compounds, we call such compounds as lamellar compounds. So one interesting uh, type of compound that is, uh, that is essentially formed when we take graphite and react with potassium vapor at around 300 degrees Celsius, what we are going to produce is an intercalated species where the potassium metal is essentially intercalated between the graphite layers and the uh, formula of, of, of this, uh, this species is essentially C8K. Now what you can do is that if we hit this species uh, at around 350 degrees Celsius we will evaporate the metal and that is how we can produce uh, species of uh, metal, uh, 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 the species with less concentration of the potassium metal and what we can have is species like C24K or uh, C36K as well as C48K, these sort of species uh, can be uh, prepared by heating the, uh, the heating C8K at temperatures above 350 degrees Celsius. So this is formed because the metal essentially gets Vaporized out of this C8K. Now the C8K is a very interesting species, or is a very interesting uh, reagent essentially, because here 
one um, as we have already discussed that graphite is conducting in nature or its electrical resistivity is pretty less as compared to diamond which is uh, insulated uh, but then when we intercalate potassium uh, inside these graphite layers what we do is uh, we increase the interlayer distance from 335 picometer to 540 picometer then we do another uh, modification structurally that is now the uh, the, the carbon atoms in a nearby in neighboring uh, graphite seeds essentially are no longer are going to be exactly stacked one over the other unlike in case of alpha graphite or in case of beta graphite here because the interlayer distance have now increased the carbon atoms on or in, uh, in nearby uh, sheets can uh, lie exactly on top of each other here once the uh, this intercalation happens so this is how what we do or this sort of uh, uh, structural modifications we do when we do uh, intercalate potassium uh, into the uh, graphite uh, layers apart from that we also change the physical other physical aspects of this compound also that is we change the or we decrease the electrical resistivity further so the electrical resistivity decreases upon uh, upon intercalation of potassium and this can be thought of as because now this uh, electron that is present in this uh, group 1 uh, in the valence cell of this group 1 element is essentially uh, occupies now the conduction band of the graphite and because of that it is its electrical resistivity uh, decreases upon intercalation of potassium and that is how it essentially gets bonded to the uh, graphite uh, layers and then apart from that it also has is we know that graphite is a diamagnetic material but the moment we intercalate uh, such um, alkali metal ions we will it will they will show or the c8k is show a very interesting magnetic property that we know as temperature independent paramagnetism or in short TIP. So these uh, differences uh, arise in the physical uh, properties. Apart from that, the, these compounds, the C8K as well as the other intercalated compounds, uh, they are extremely highly reactive in nature and in, in, in fact they can be used as uh, reducing agents for reducing different uh, species because these electropositive metals like potassium, sodium, uh, lithium they are good reducing agent because of the uh, unpaired electron present in their valence cell. They want to donate this electron readily to other uh, chemical species and uh, by these intercalating compounds or upon intercalation with graphite also, uh, they uh, do act as a good reducing agent and at times because it is difficult to handle uh, these uh, uh, group 1 uh, metals uh, safely because we know that sodium when it comes in con into contact with um, moisture or water, it reacts violently. Similarly, the, the actually reactivity of potassium is much higher as compared to uh, sodium and it is, uh, it is quite difficult to handle potassium as a bare metal and instead if one intercalates potassium with graphite, its reactivity is somewhat diminished and now we can use uh, this particular material as a reducing agent. Uh, which you know, uh, which uh, it, it is with e easy handling. So that is how it is helpful as a synthetic reagent. C8K is quite useful, and the reactivity of these species decreases as we go uh, down the group. That is, lithium is going to be highest reactive, and then sodium, and then potassium, and then rubidium, and then uh, cesium. This is how the reactivity of intercalated species decreases uh, for you know as we go down the group in for group one elements. So this is how this uh, intercalation of alkali metals in uh, layered graphite essentially 
uh, produces a useful synthetic uh, reagent as well as it also has interesting physical as well as structural uh, properties. So, we will discuss about uh, the other allotropes of carbon uh, in more detail in the next lecture and we, uh, during this lecture what we have essentially learned uh, about uh, the uh, physical uh, the periodic properties of different group 14 elements we have looked at the electronic configuration as well as we have seen how the uh, periodic properties vary with the electronic configuration and then we have also looked at different types of isotopes available for carbon and silicon and we have looked at the implicate use of these isotopes in especially in nmr spectroscopy as well as in carbon dating and then we have looked at uh, different types of allotropes that are available for uh, carbon and we discussed about uh, one particular allotrope that is about graphite and different types of phases of graphite as well as the kind of reactions that graphite undergoes and the kind of modifications that we can do by using these alkali metals and the sort of uh, structural modifications or the structural changes that happens upon intercalation of potassium uh, or other alkali metals to uh, this graphite as well as the kind of a change in physical properties as well as chemical behavior upon intercalation of potassium. So with this let me conclude this lecture and I thank you very much for being with me during this lecture.